Hello, and welcome back to the Creative Impact Conference at Telemusic Week 2020 here at the Estonian Academy of Arts. My name is Ben Batke. I'm a journalist um, based in Berlin, and uh, I look forward to this interview with uh, the president of Estonia, Kersti Kajulait. It's fitting that in these uncertain times, especially around conferences, that it was only two days ago that I received a call from Helen Siltner asking me whether I wanted to interview the president of Estonia. And uh, I thought it was a tall order, but I thought uh, uncertainty requires courage, so I said yes. And I did my best to prepare, so I hope uh, very much that I will be able to live up to this task. Uh, the person next to me, as I said, uh, Kesti Kajulait, doesn't need much of an introduction. She is a highly sought after conference speaker. I feel like every time I'm in Estonia, I see you on at least one stage. Yesterday she opened Latitude 59's tech conference. Two days ago she was at a virtual conference, uh, a current affairs and foreign affairs conference. Um, and so she's, she's all over the place. She's very outspoken about a lot of topics and very, very present. Um, so a bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, we will talk about 45 minutes, about broadly about the themes of this year's edition of Tele Music Week. 30 minutes will be bilateral, and then the last 50 minutes, more or less, we'll take questions both from the audience here in the auditorium at the Estonian uh, Center of Arts, as well as those from virtual attendees, and Helen Siltner will be taking those. So please already think of questions now and as the conversation unfolds and submit them so we can, we can uh, pass them on to Madame President. And with that, uh, I want to get started. And the first topic I want to talk about actually is uh, female leadership. So uh, as this, this, the, this pandemic has ravaged the world, uh, turns out that countries led by women like New Zealand and Germany, seem to be particularly successful in fighting the coronavirus. And I mean, heads of states. I mean, um, so I mean, Estonia has been also faring very well. So I wanna ask you what lessons do women's success offer about what can help countries weather not just this crisis, but also other crises in the future? Well, frankly speaking, uh, yeah, I've heard that before, uh, but this is false. Our Minister of Social Affairs is, is a man. The, the lead, of course, the, the person, persons who have been leading the health authority, they have been women too, but uh, contrary in Germany, they weren't. So uh, nothing doing here with gender. But um, I think women in, uh, in leadership in countries uh, bear enormous responsibility. First of all, they have to be normally better than men in the same job. Because otherwise, I mean, if we fail, then everybody says, well, but at least she was a woman, so that was already something. So if you really, really... <laughs> If you really want to have a positive impact of, on all young ladies of this country and the others, then you really have to work very hard. Maybe that's why I'm overdoing it and being present at, um, at every occasion. I will, I will censor myself more in the future. Uh, UN uh, once a year holds uh, a, women, a Women's Week where women leaders come together and it's like meeting your biggest agony aunt ever. I mean, we all tell each other the stories, how we have been intercepted and told not to go where we're just going, because of course you are a woman and you don't look like the part. And even in that week uh, last year, when we were just to get on the stage together with some other female leaders, the Icelandic president, she's an ice lady of 40, and uh, well, she wears trousers, has hands in the pockets, and doesn't paint her face. Well, she was asked, where's the prime minister? Well, we gather these stories and we tell these stories and, and told from our post, I think the world has to look into the mirror. Right, so you're saying that it's not just heads of states, female heads of states where it's beneficial, but across the board in leadership, also in business where... By the way, your question would have been considered an unconscious gender bias by specialists in the matter. I learned these, these words from... Uh, from uh, people in the United States uh, who deal with these matters. I'm, myself, I'm not a feminist. I never thought I was. And I know I'm a conservative. Only in this country people think differently. All right. I'll keep that in mind. So I guess it could fall into the category of, of a microaggression, which <laughs> I think <laughs> we, we all have to think about our biases now these days. 
uh, I think that that's important. Thanks for uh, pointing that out. Um, so, I mean, but generally, people of, having people of diverse backgrounds, having a seat at the table and having a say, I think that's that's more what you're uh, what you're saying, right? Um, in, in when it comes to science, uh, people making decisions, and uh, that's it needs to be broad. It's not just about uh, one person in charge. It needs to be across the board. Yes, and I think uh, to a certain extent, we have to understand also that um, these things go in spirals. I think our uh, well. Women, the age of my mother, for example, in Western Europe thought they have arrived because they were allowed a place in the workforce. But then we grew up and said that, look, mom, yes, it's true that you were allowed into the work, workforce and workplace, but for that you had to give up being a woman. I mean, you had to turn into man. I mean, you had to make sure that your children and your family life do not intervene with your job, etc. You also sometimes, well, had to maybe well, suppress your feelings, not to show them, because, of course, I mean, then you would have not been assertive. You would have been uh, nervous or agitated or whatever. And, and, uh, and this, uh, this does not satisfy the women of this generation who want that. I mean, men and women are truly equal, being different. And this is terribly important to understand that men have only to win from this, from being also able to go out and push the pram of a baby and all these things. This is the true equality, and, and this is not against anybody. I, I mean, equality and freedoms, they recreate themselves when you share them, and this is so, so important. I can relate to that. Thank you, Ed. It's worth a round of applause. <laughs> I have a four-month-old son at home, so I can, I live up to that. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I'm trying to live up to, to that ideal that uh, my partner and I um, share, or, um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> How often you change nappies? <laughs> All the time. As much as I mean, I work part time, so it's it's we're trying to have it have it in uh, an equitable uh, kind of um, arrangement. Um, so I want to move on to the next topic, which is mental health, and it was it's kind of overlooked so far. That's been my impression, at least. Um, the most the first and most immediate effect um, of the pandemic, by nature, was um, sickness and death because as people were contracting the virus by the hundreds of thousands, followed by an economic crisis uh, due to travel restrictions and lockdowns. Of course, of course, businesses had to shut down and millions of people were laid off. And so maybe you can say that the, the third uh, dimension of this pandemic, of this crisis, is a social one. Uh, and so it start, we've already started seeing some of it with an uptick in domestic violence, but I think this will be mostly having long-term effects on people's uh, mental health. We're talking about people working from home, um, obviously uh, all the physical distancing and not uh, allowing visitation rules at um, elderly homes and so forth. So I was wondering, um, you're, because you yourself have been very vocal about the importance of human interaction. Just yesterday you said that being in the same room has a special value. So what have your observations been? And uh, how do you make sure that the focus isn't just on the economic uh, impact, but also on our psychological safety? Yes, this is true. Only today, this morning, we were talking about the Estonian courts. And in principle, we could run them online. I mean, it's perfectly possible. But I mean, people in the room, also in the court, they need to feel. I mean, it's totally intangible. But you would sense whether people really take into heart what you have taken to the court, if they really feel with you and sometimes for you. And you cannot take this away from humankind. So indeed, uh, it's easy to keep up uh, good friendships and relations which you have somewhere knitted before. But to make new ones, I have to say I have been very sorry for freshly elected presidents. I mean, a fourth year president has all the friends in the world and all you need to do is pick up the phone and call and ask how you're doing, how your people doing. And we do this all the time. It's so important because I mean, in this world, friendship is, is what I mean, keeps us together. It's not any, anymore the, the old-fashioned way of, I mean, somebody at lower level takes contact and then you move high up in the hierarchy. It's so much more direct nowadays, relations at all level. And that is why I believe we need to have uh, the old good le couloir to really knit these relations together. And indeed, coming into the same room it does matter enormously. On mental health, when you were talking, I, I started to think that um, we've seen a lot of uh, younger people, people who uh, 
come from culture and, uh, and other maybe more kind of sensitive sectors, they have started to talk out, speak out in Estonian papers about their depression, about their eating disorders, about the mental health issues, and particularly this year. And I think it has something doing with this pandemic. But, I mean, they sense that in them coming out and breaking yet another wall of silence, which we still have in this society, might help those suffering. And I, I so value what they are doing, and I, um, I, I admire their courage, and I, and I wish that each and every one in this society felt that they can speak out, and that it wouldn't take courage, but it still does. So you just mentioned the wall of silence, and you're talking about Estonia there. Um, and then, so I wanted to reference Italian university study, a recent one on wellness and mental health, which found that nearly one third of respondents exhibited above average symptoms hinting at depression. Um, and so do you think this has changed in recent years, um, that people now actually have the courage to, to go uh, to see a doctor and get help? Um, and and then how far do we still have to go, you think? Uh, in Estonia, we have a long way to go, and I'm afraid in other countries too, because first of all, we don't have enough specialists. Uh, we, like, we lack uh, the specialists to help uh, everybody, and, and this is a big worry, because even if people risk to come out, they also risk to face the situation where, I mean, there isn't anybody professional to help them. And, and this is a burden which I feel uh, on my heart. So, because I've been also talking for four years for people to come out with their worries, speak up against violence, speak about violence which they've seen and so on. And I know that there is a dire shortage of specialists to help them. But luckily, there is something powerful which is the support by the community of people who really understand what this kind of suffering means. And then, Finally, there is culture, and I also had uh, a wonderful feeling when uh, I was sitting in, uh, in uh, St. John's Church last Saturday, and uh, Maria Missa by Maria Faust was presented first time ever. And um, you sit there and you suddenly hear that what you have been standing for now starts to echo through our cultural space. And it's enormously gratifying feeling. You, you know that even if we don't have solutions to the questions of violence, to the lack of attention towards violence, particularly home violence, uh, lots of people are scared about all this open talking about violence. Culture can help. Culture can do it in a softer way. Well, Maria Missa doesn't do it in a softer way, but, but it can also have half tunes in it. And and I, I see that, I mean, this, even without having kind of quick solution, is changing the society. And I'm quite sure that this change is, uh, well, you cannot turn it back anymore. As soon as the cultural space takes matters in their hand, they're there. It's like when we regained independence. We had something which Estonians called Lomeli to the Plenum or a Congress of, uh, of, uh, of Estonian, uh, well, culture elite or I don't know how you translate it, certainly official translation exists, I just don't know it. Creative unions, yes. Uh, well, Congress of Creative Unions, sounds very Soviet to pronounce this way, but anyway. And, and they were the ones who uh, carried Estonia to independence, because if they speak, then Estonian people follow. And that is what I was thinking last Saturday as well. I mean, we have arrived. Despite the fact that we are still lonely at the beginning of the road, we have arrived. Thanks. Uh, you just mentioned the word independence. So I want to talk about the situation in Belarus, if that's okay, because that's a good segue. Um, this week, Putin said that he ordered the creation of a special force of officers to be deployed at request of Lukashenko, and that the force would not be used unless, quote, the situation gets out of control. So. Do you think Putin is afraid of the protests and because it might give Russians ideas and that the protests might put possibly spill over into Russia? I don't know. I cannot pick the brain of, of President Putin. What I can say is that um, what Belarusian people are doing is quite similar to what we were doing here. I mean, absolutely peaceful, calm, 
calm demonstrations. We were so worried in late 80s that some, something will provoke people into, into burning the cars or smashing the windows, and, and it didn't ever happen. I mean, societies which can demonstrate such discipline in silently, calmly standing up for their right to decide, deserve a right to decide. And by the way, we know that Belarusian people are closely, feeling very closely affiliated also to Russian people, and that they are not seeking necessarily uh, what we were seeking, like uh, reunification with Europe uh, in the means of European Union, etc. Not at all. And I think we should not intervene, but we should stand there and remind everybody that uh, you have the right to decide. And this is, this is the position the Baltic states, Poland, most vocally, but also the other European nations have taken, up to the level of the European Commission president, who, uh, who was very quick in uh, her notion that sanctions might be needed. And just a quick follow-up question. Uh, what, what could happen, uh, well, what would the EU need to do if that option is being taken away from the Belarusian people, if it's not in their own hands to decide whether they want to go in a pro-democracy direction or maybe something that looks a bit less than a democracy? I really cannot speculate, because by this speculation I would already intervene. And what I want to do is I would really uh, uh, leave space for Belarusian people to peacefully, hopefully, stand there and gain this opportunity. When things start to go wrong and terribly wrong, then uh, Lithuania and Latvia have already said that they are very open for refugees as well. But, uh, but uh, our government as well has decided to uh, put aside some money to help uh, well humanitarian case in Belarus if needed. But uh, if we start speculating, uh, I think that might actually do harm to the process, so I don't. Sure. So let's focus on the people then. Again, uh, earlier today, some of you might have seen it, we had two people joining us virtually live, one from... Belarus, the other one from Beirut, and who gave uh, passionate speeches. They talked about the situation on the ground, what's it like for artists, and also about the failures of their government. S and they were both from the creative sector. So a quick follow-up question there. Um, how do you think the creative sector can play a role in rising, um, excuse me, raising awareness of crises? Because at the end of the day, um, if attention um, it depends on the media coverage, it depends on powerful nations actually having an interest in the country where a crisis is ongoing. The quicker the uptake by creative uh, society, uh, the more, I mean, validation politicians get that they are on the right way, because after all, I mean, this intangible network of, uh, of uh, creative people in each and every word is our consciousness. And if they don't support you, then you really, I mean, feel lonely. And if they do, then you don't. So indeed, the more creative people globally can unify and raise their voice for all those who are currently fighting for their right to decide for themselves, democratic rights, human rights, the better off we are. And we know that the uh, creative sector everywhere is, is doing it. But then, of course, I mean, you have to have a particular concrete cause with concrete objectives so that you could really feel that you are making difference. If it's a diffuse, let's have peace globally, let's make sure that nobody ever suffers. I mean, yes, they are, they are the, the, the cries for the United Nations to achieve, and yet we know it will never be achieved. So those who are close by, and we are close by to Belarus, uh, we are able to translate also, and the creative sector of this can work with ours, and, and this can be translated into the, into the Western Europe. Because many in Western Europe, uh, I mean, they, they don't want, above all, another Ukraine. And uh, those who don't just want another Ukraine, they don't even know that there's Belarus and, and, and why exactly people are protesting. So bringing this message home to, uh, to people a little bit further afield is something which creative uh, people globally can do, musicians, artists, everybody. Right, thank you. I think we have about 10 minutes left before we'll start taking questions from the audience. Uh, I want to ask you for something you said two days ago at uh, the Globesec conference I had mentioned. Uh, at the beginning, um, and that was that uh, this pandemic uh, is also a test of citizenship and uh, of citizen responsibility. And we've just been talking about this too, about 
we have people's power, which also about the responsibility. So since you didn't go into much detail at the conference, but it certainly sparked my interest, uh, I just wondered if you could go uh, into, yeah, just explain what you meant by that. Yes, when this uh, epidemic uh, started in Estonia, I started to do uh, uh, Zoom lessons in Estonian schools, and we're discussing with children this, that very often, very often, you, it, it is said that the future of Estonia depends of each and everyone, and we never can analyze or, or even doesn't bother to analyze. Is it true or is it false? How much we feel that what I do today really has influence on my on, on my country's future? I mean, if you are, for example, Seem Kallas, who is responsible for Estonia moving quickly from ruble zone to krona, then you look back and you, say, you can see immediately, I mean, where is your influence on this country? But for the rest of us, it's not so simple, so easy. And now suddenly it is. I mean, each and every citizen, based on the information what democratic governments have bestowed upon them, create their own risk matrices and act according to these risk matrices. And in two weeks' time, I mean, the decisions by each and every one will have a direct impact on our nation, looking at the hospital beds which are occupied. This is the lesson of citizenship, isn't it? Which brings us back to leadership, because if scientists and politicians don't provide um, current information and also admit shortcomings and constantly update on the situation, um, just uh, look at the US when uh, we have a president who says that uh, bleach or a disinfectants, if you swallow it, that will cure the, uh, you're from the coronavirus, and people have been doing that by the hundreds. And so I think, would you agree that it goes back to leadership? Because when does that empower citizens with the right uh, information based on the current level of information? Or? I don't want to speak about uh, any particular nation, but what I want to say is that errors, even in leadership, can be corrected by the society in case society has open information. Therefore, totalitarian regimes, which limit the access to information, I mean, they definitely fare worse. And in the beginning of the pandemics and after the first wave subsided, I think there was a lot of thinking that China was managing terribly well. I'm sorry, but I mean, if China had managed it in an open way, like, like open societies do, we would have known months earlier something's wrong. I mean, you cannot imagine that here in Estonia you have a hospital full of people with pneumonia and no paper is writing about it. And if papers are writing about it, scientists know, scientists go and investigate, and we catch on. Maybe we wouldn't even have the pandemics if that had been the case. Democratic nations, on the contrary, they cannot restrict access to information. Leaders can also try to kind of force restrictions. But I believe that in the long run, because we know now that this pandemic is with us for quite some time, and with the depletion of ecosystems, I'm afraid this is not the last pandemic which we will see in our lifetime. I mean, in democratic countries, you base your reaction on honestly telling people what is at stake. And you rely on citizens taking citizens' responsibility. I mean, we are grown-up people in democratic citizens. I've grown up in a totalitarian country. I was expected to remain child forever, never being able to decide, never given full picture. It will certainly be interesting, worth a round of applause. <laughs> certainly interesting to watch uh, how democratic societies versus totalitarian regimes will fare uh, to be um, things um, news have come out of China very recently that oh, the economy is already improving and they might actually see uh, the economy growing this year despite of all the um, because of, of the uh, despite the recession but uh, that's something more of uh, something that's to be observed um, and that is um, probably very hard As to an answer economist, right now. I can tell you that it's only natural I mean with such a big internal market with with the uh, break from economy removed of course they're back to growth they don't rely so much on external markets they can create also for certain period also the internal growth sure. but our economies are doing the v-shape uh, recession here as well sure yeah i think we have time for one more question before we start taking questions from the audience so if, if you're thinking about any question please uh, send them to uh, in our, our way uh, i want to talk about the climate crisis um, if maybe some of you remember that uh, about a week ago there was earth overshoot day and over the last years this this day has moved 
so has been always sooner. So that means that uh, we have depleted the world's resources uh, very, very soon. I think last year was in July, and this year it was in, in August, so three weeks later, uh, which means that the coronavirus pandemic obviously has spared resources. So that means that the danger now is that 2020 will remain an exotic exception. So I wanted to ask you what, um, which behavior, which political methods uh, of the current crisis we can continue long term to tackle the climate crisis and we don't leave this, this opportunity uh, yeah, just lying around. Well, I see how much um, governments and, for example, also the European Union is ready to put up money to recover economy. And the European Union has made a wise decision not to give this money without strings attached. And the strings are related to fighting and combating climate change. And I believe that the only way this planet can be saved is that the European Union really makes uh, businesses to believe that our market distortion on the richest and biggest global mar single market globally, I mean, is there to stay. And if you look at the CO2 price levels, I mean, the market is now believing this. This means the technologies will come out on this market and replace the polluting technologies. And then the rest of the world, well, can have these technologies thereafter because they are simply economical. They don't even need to believe into the, uh, into the climate change to adapt to these technologies. They will simply be, well, no more expensive. If this wouldn't happen uh, this way, then I'm afraid there is absolutely no remedy for climate change because I simply don't see any other mechanism. I mean, COP is a wonderful exercise and, and I support it with all my heart. But you need uh, a big enough economy to bear the risk and the burden of the transition. You need a set of dedicated politicians to, I mean, repeat the message long enough and, and also use the concrete signal, which is, I mean, CO2 price in 2050 is infinite and keep this going long enough for technology to, to start coming along. This is the only way we can do it. I mean, it's still good old economy, which will, I mean, get us out of this trouble where good old economy got us in the first place. Okay, so if I understood you correctly, then the EU stimulus package is a good start, but the onus is also on the private sector to come up with technologies. Yes, I'm a... Uh, I really believe that, that finally economy is changed by private sector and the public sector has to set conditions and in this one example the private sector has to heed the condition set by the public sector which is no emissions by 2050 and I just read that Poland probably will be there by 2035-40 with the current CO2 prices so uh, congratulations to Poland and I hope that we in Estonia get our, uh, our feet out and start running too. We still lack these 2000 megawatts of wind power and some pump storage about 550 megawatts which is in pipeline for Estonia. Uh, I think we started a few minutes late, so can we do another question or should we take a question from the audience now? One more? One more. Here we go. Okay, this is, this is a kind of a forward-looking question, um, Madam President. And uh, earlier today, um, Kimo Aolake, I hope I pronounced his name right, he's Finnish. Okay, close. Well, not really, but anyway. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, he is the ministerial advisor at the Finnish Ministry of Education and Culture, and I think he said something really pithy, and that was, quote, not only do we need a vaccine against the virus, but also a vaccine for societal resilience with culture as a major ingredient. Um, and she also pointed, pointed out that studies show that culture strengthens democracy as well as well-being. So could you comment on that? How could such a vaccine look like? Um, and what needs to be part of it? Education, other parts? What are your thoughts? Yes, I talk quite a lot on conferences about education and how this is to change. And we know that, I mean, the, the main challenge for the school today is from technology in this sense that, I mean, when I went to school, then each and every 10-year-old roughly knew the same stuff. Now 10-year-olds, I don't know. My kid, I mean, he knows how SpaceX is built and, and he knew when it was going to land and, and he knows what's dark matter and so on. But I mean, he doesn't give a damn about history, for example. And there are other children who really know history very well and, and I mean, they, they all together speak fluent English, but they cannot write. And, and uh, he told me that some friends don't understand which are rude words because nobody has ever told them. So you see, teachers face kids in the same classroom who have totally different knowledge base, which is new. Which means that teachers should have tools 
to have each and every child in the classroom doing something which is, I mean, worth of their level, getting the feeling that they are succeeding and getting somewhere. And it's definitely going to be 10 different levels in the class of 30. So instead of teaching, they will support learning in the future. And I think this pandemic, at least in Estonia, has created enough material that we can put such a school together, if we, if we so wish, where all the material is there and all teachers can use it and all kids can, I mean, really amuse them in the lessons and never feel, I mean, they're bored or something. Or also stupid, because others seem to know more. They would be dealing on their level with stuff. But this creates another question, totally unexpected probably, but for me very obvious. No. When most of the life happens, I mean, uh, well, in contact with the computer, we need to put very special emphasis to teach our children to be compassionate human beings. I mean, this doesn't happen like for us. You went to the shop, you had to behave nicely because otherwise you were treated badly. I mean, they don't have this kind of daily, low-risk low kind of human interactions by which you learn to be a compassionate human being. So we now need to have a special part in curriculum dedicated to that psychology, those subjects? I don't know how you would call them, but, uh, but I mean, simply learning how you do still human interactions without offending anybody, standing up to yourself calmly, and in general, finding your place, your niche in the society, feeling enough self-assurance when, when facing humans and, and I'm not being intimidated, which normally, I mean, gives an aggressive reaction, etc. I'm very weak in social sciences myself. I just observe what I see in the society, so I cannot use the right vocabulary. But uh, this is what we need to do. Right. So education sector is certainly undergoing a, a change, and that might be accelerated by the pandemic. Are we? Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, so I will, uh, before you actually think about your questions, I have one of my own, if I may. Uh, <laughs> Um, many of the things uh, have been on my mind, but um, well, since March up until now and for for a while, I guess, the cultural sector and especially the events side of the cultural sector has been in huge challenges. And I personally have felt that there is a kind of drop in confidence and also in a way like being stigmatized in the society. That, you know, it's not maybe the most responsible things to even try to hold up events. And, you know, these were questions that we had to ask, uh, answer many times with Tallinn Music Week, that is it, is it a responsible thing to do? So um, any ideas or reflections that we can think together and um, how can the cultural sector innovate together with scientists, for example, or what could be a way out if a, there's a whole sector that depends on people coming together? What's a way, a possible way out in a situation like that? Well, in Estonian case, I guess summer has been the way out, <laughs> because if you're outside, this virus is not as contagious as it is, as it is indoors. Uh, I think uh, what is most important is that you are open about these worries and that we keep pointing out that we have these worries and, and these risks and that you feel like you're not welcome to do things. I mean, and, and even if you feel that there is some kind of unfair treatment, like one sector is not welcome, another is. If you air these suspicions, it's so important, you know why? Because of course also this virus is being used as a fig leaf to get your own position, I mean, uh, up front and forward. And, and I, I don't think it's only happening here. I'm quite sure it's happening globally. I mean, there are many people who also, among other things, try to use this virus. And, and then you have to, uh, I mean, call it out. And, and we need to have fierce debates about equal treatment and, and analyze it deeply in society, not to be afraid. And above all, above all, not to be intimidated because it's so easy to seek out one group and intimidate them and say you are the bad ones today. Next week there will be the next bad ones. And then the worst thing you could do is to either, I mean, breathe easily, I'm not the bad guy next week, I'm this week only. I mean, you have to go there together with the bad guys next week and warn that there will be yet another group of society who will be the bad boys thereafter, or bad girls, of course. Girls are more often bad, I'm understood, <laughs> in this kind of uh, well, pressure situations. And we have to stand up to the other groups, not kind of breathe a sigh of relief that I am not in that group. You will be one day. Yes. 
Que thank you. Questions from the audience. Please raise your hand and I will come and uh, reach you. So can we pass over the microphone from here? Hi there, my name's Stuart. I'm from the UK, a uh, journalist. Um, in the UK, we had quite slow support coming for the cultural sector. There was not very much support at all, and then there was quite a lot of protests. And after that, there was more financial support for the cultural sector. Um, so I wanted to ask, what do you see as government's responsibility to the arts and to the cultural sector, to protecting, especially in this current climate? It's a difficult one because basically, uh, as I said, I mean, I'm conservative, but in addition, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm kind of a freedom school, Friedman School of Economic Thinking. So I do uh, believe in as much space for private sector as possible at all. At the same time, realizing that, I mean, northern countries and, and also luckily Estonia are countries of high tax burden, which allows the state to create this kind of network, which makes uh, state into the uh, insurer of the last resort. And uh, in insurer of the last resort, well, has to, I mean, give, give, uh, give hand and, and put protective network on the each and every sector equally. This is, I mean, my message that you have to guarantee equal treatment. It doesn't matter. I mean, for example, I love theater and I'm wary about blockbusters. And so I go very rarely to cinema, but I would be deeply disapp uh, d d really disapproving of preferring theater to cinema. I mean, in this context. Or, I mean, there are some artists who uh, are maybe thinking more like the, the power and some others who are thinking less like the power. I think they should be, I mean, you should not only support them equally, but go the extra mile to demonstrate that you're doing so this way. This is very important, that the support is equal. And I've analyzed and thought about what is state, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, European social market economy model probably fits this compassionate society which we need nowadays best. I mean, there are other perfectly democratic nations where the state does not take upon itself this role of uh, final insurer. The state remains a power both towards inside and outside the country, but it is not insurer. It seems like in these situations, it is necessary that the state takes this responsibility. Attention, this means high tax burdens, 30, 40% probably of the GDP. And for me, I mean, I started already thinking about this in January when there was no pandemic because I was visiting Santiago, Chile, and they had protests there. People were protesting because their country is not the last insurer for each and everyone. And I realized they're in deep trouble, you know why? Because, I mean, French also had gilet jaune and all this thing, but the tax burden is 50 there. So you only need to kick the state in order, which is in the hands of every politician. You can easily do it. What to do if the tax burden is around 20? and your people demand a social market economy. It's far, far harder there. Thank you. There's another question actually over Zoom, and we have August there, who's our Zoom uh, moderator. Uh, can you please read out the question to us, August? Yes, thank you. Uh, Alar Gutman is asking, for years have I seen Tali Music Week working consciously with inclusion, regardless of religious, ethnical, and social background of all Estonia, simply fantastic. What importance does culture and the creative sector have for influencing society in healing wounds of the past and driving towards unity? Asked by a proud Estonian Saarema Islander by origin. <laughs> My island too, greetings to the island. Come from that island for foreigners who don't know. Well, keep up our hope and never shut up if possible. I mean, yes, it's uncomfortable sometimes to talk out, but please keep keep doing it and keep putting our noses, the politicians' noses, I mean, in, in the trouble which we have created and, and, and keep airing your worries. And also, you know, keep going on these stages and present the weirdest characters. I mean, you can, I mean, from all ends of uh, society, from all the margins of society, we need to, I mean, feel exercised and trained to understand that humankind has huge variety, that we are not all very similar. And, and the variety doesn't always, I mean, stand out for your eyes to look at, but the variety is there. And, and culture for me always has been the one which presents me 
different people and, and really, really, well, sometimes very convoluted personalities. I mean, on the stage, I can think, I can understand, I can analyze it. I, I hope it makes me also a kind of more understanding politician. Thank you. Do we have that applause? Is completely justified. Thank you. <laughs> Do we have one more question from the audience? Uh, yes, here we are. Hi. Uh, in your last question, you spoke of, uh, like last interview question, you spoke of the importance of using education of children to protect democracy. How do we go about educating adults to protect democracy? We see the rise of dishonest populism, conspiracy theories through social media, QAnon and the like. Uh, President uh, Kalyalad, how do we go about educating adults to ensure that democracy is safe as well? I think we need to make sure that we understand why we were seeing Brexit, why we see electoral behavior which seems to accept simple but impossible solutions and, and gilets jaunes and all this. I mean, we need to understand that our perfectly democratic societies, well-developed countries, have let the hopes of simple people to stagnate for far too long. There is intergenerational poverty stemming from the fact that people who, I mean, are not at least in the middle class and sometimes even in the upper middle class, cannot guarantee good education for their children. Egalitarian education system is the beginning of all democratic societies. I may be doing badly, but if I know that my child can become a neurosurgeon, I mean, I will, I mean, respect and accept what is going on in this society. But if I know that those who are better off than me or have done different life choices, that they will be able to, to kind of prolong this advantage in the society into generations to come, I mean, there is, there is lack of social mobility, then I feel truly hopeless. And then I'm ready to break everything because I have nothing to lose in this society. And, and I believe this is a lot of what we are seeing. Also here in Estonia, for a while, we had a tendency to neglect the worries of, let's say, retired people living in rural areas. And, uh, and, and even if we initially couldn't do much about it then, because the country was very poor when we regained independence, we could have recognized the problem. But if you start saying that on average, Estonia is an economic miracle, you already start ignoring the, uh, the, the margins who are not well enough. And if you look on average, France is very rich, on average UK is very rich, but we know that people who do perfectly, I mean, respectable jobs in society cannot, well, hire a two-bedroom apartment in Paris or in London. They need to rely on state support, housing support, I mean, in-jobs, benefits. This is ridiculous, in-job, benefit, is a subsidy for bankers' cheaper pizzas and coffees in central London. I mean, they are, if you look at the matter. People need to feel that their work is appreciated in society, and if they pay taxes, their children get as good education and as everybody else. Our time is up. Um, I will ask the last question, if I may. The question will be, is there a silver lining in this pandemic? Is there something positive we've been able to witness within these months? Yes, as I already said, I think Estonian people have become more sensitive about the worries of society, more open about the, uh, the issues which are perturbing us. And this shows that we are ready to stand up and say that we are feather weathering all this storm together. We are not going to fight each other for finite resources. We are going to stand together and try to kind of uh, uh, equally, uh, equally uh, share the burden in the society. So this is the silver lining that we have not turned into a, into a gang of people in opposing groups who are only fighting for resources. The European Union decision to uh, work on vaccines and its equal distribution is one of the best signs for me in that. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, join me in a round of applause for <laughs> Cassie Kalyalite.